in this subchapter, you will learn about what machine learning models actually are, the types of machine learning that are most common, whilst also gaining a high level understanding of how they're trained to learn a new task, which will give you a foundation to then go deeper with real examples later in the course. You'll also learn what you need to know when gathering data so that it has the best chance of working well. So let's get to it. First, let's define what a machine learning model actually is. You'll hear the term model used a lot in the context of ML, and you can think of this as a magic black box for which the internal logic is hidden for now that takes some inputs and gives you some outputs. The key thing to note here is that these inputs and outputs are always numerical. You'll learn more about this hidden logic later in the course when you start to write your own models. But for now, you can think of it as essentially a bunch of mathematics that transforms the inputs into the output values from which you can then make some useful decision. For example, if the machine learning model was designed to recognize different species of flower from some input values, then each output number may represent the probability of how confident it was that a certain type of flower was represented by those input values. And what might those input values be exactly? Well, maybe they represent the color of the flower's petals, or maybe they represent the stem length. Each model you make will require specific inputs that represent something about the thing you're trying to learn about. And later, you'll see how you, as a machine learning engineer, will define these for yourself. But once you've fed data into the model, you can then take the output and decide if you want to do something based on what it's predicted if it has a certain level of confidence. In the example shown here, the system produces outputs that range from zero to one. So in this instance, if we take the highest number on the output, we can see that Rose has the highest prediction as it has the highest score. In this particular example, the output is actually a score of confidence. So 0.78 out of one is equivalent to saying 78%. Therefore, we also know that the system is 78% sure that it saw a Rose. You can take this knowledge and use it in your regular web application logic to then do something useful. In fact, often the machine learning part of your program will just be a small part of the overall code that you write. Most of your code will be the regular programming that you're already familiar with, namely the application logic, the user interface, or retrieving something from, say, a database on a server. Now, the other thing I'd like to highlight at this point is that initially the machine learning model is untrained, and this means it's probably no better than flipping a bunch of coins to decide what the output values are, which is not very useful to you. You must then train the model to make it good at a certain task. And there are many different ways you can do that. In fact, there are three key forms of machine learning that are used today. First up, and by far the most common, is supervised learning. All this means is that the data that you'll use to train the machine learning system is pre-labeled like you see here on the scatter plot of fruit data points. Here, I plot the weight and color for some fruit samples. Each data point has a corresponding label associated with it that you know to be correct, in this case, apples and oranges. You therefore know the ground truth for each example you're going to show the system to learn from. This is important because when you train the machine learning system, at the start, it'll be wrong a lot of the time, but it can realize this right away from our known labels and then change itself slightly to automatically be better next time around. And if you think about it, this is very similar to how human babies are taught. You show them an object and then tell them the name for it. And just like a human learning, you're probably needing to show a few examples before it will be able to distinguish between such objects correctly. Now, one thing to note here is that for an ML system, you might need thousands of examples if you're training the system from a completely blank canvas. Often, there is a lot of variation for something even as simple as an apple, as you can see here. Size, shape, color, even textures and more can change from one apple to another. And as a computer is just dealing with numbers, an image of an apple is essentially millions of color values from an image. So these variations can lead to very different outcomes as far as the computer is concerned. So if the system has only ever seen green apples to learn from, it will probably misclassify other types of apples thinking it's something else. Now this point is really important. Computers can only work with numbers. 
which is very different to how you and I consciously process data. On the left is a magnified image of a person. Now as a human, you can probably make out where the face is pretty fast. But a computer cannot see objects like you and I can, it just sees numbers as shown by the middle image. Here, numbers from 0 to 255 represent different shades of grey. And on the right hand side is what would be fed into your machine learning model as an input. Do you still see the face in that? Well, as a human, it's nearly impossible to recognize in this form, but this is what your machine learning model must learn from and somehow take these numbers to produce some output that represent how sure it is that a face is in those input numbers. And this is why the quality of training data is very important. Generally speaking, the more diverse and well labeled your data, the better machine learning model you'll be able to train that can generalize well to unseen examples in the future. Now next up, we've got unsupervised learning. Taking the same example as before, you've got a bunch of example data plotted on the graph as shown, but in this situation, you don't know what the labels are in advance. The only thing you might know is how many classes you expect to discover from the data. Now, as you know from the previous example, the data shown here represents apples and oranges, which means two possible classes of data. As such, you can train the machine learning program to attempt to cluster the data together finding what data is most likely to be related. Looking at these data points, you can instinctively see as a human that there are two distinct clusters of points as shown, which the machine learning program might also learn. The program, however, doesn't know which cluster of points represent an apple versus which is an orange. In fact, it would not even know the existence of such things, so it would return general class names like class A or class B, and then you would have to make the correlation later on. One other point to note is that you might not always know how many total classes there are in the data. In this case, you might decide to take an educated guess, for example, three, to see how well it works with your data set. And here, the machine learning system will find three clusters for you, even though there are only two real ones to be found. The computer will always do what it's told. And clustering like this, however, can be useful in domains where true labels are hard to obtain, while still allowing you to classify data in meaningful ways. In fact, unsupervised learning powers systems you might already be using, like recommendation engines, to find similarities between what person A bought versus what person B currently has in a shopping cart, to suggest items for the person who is still shopping. And once an unsupervised model has been trained, it's typical that human testing is then required to validate that it performs well for the task at hand. This is kind of the opposite of supervised learning, where you spend more time up front labeling the data, but can then be pretty sure that it works as intended once trained, as it's able to score itself as it goes along. Finally, you've also got reinforcement learning. This is a newer area of research that has had success in areas such as gaming, robotics, and even scientific research that can vary wildly in performance depending on the problem at hand, as it ultimately relies on trial and error. In essence, this form of machine learning tries to take actions to achieve a goal in such a way to maximize a reward that's defined. In this example, you can see a character in a virtual environment learning how to walk using reinforcement learning. When it fails, it tries variations to attempt to get better at the task. But you might be surprised sometimes at the results. Here, the character uses his arm to balance correctly in a somewhat unnatural way but in this game, it works better than the other things it had tried previously. And what seems obvious to a human might not be the result you see as shown here. So one must use such systems with caution and thoroughly test the solution that it creates. In the case of a computer game, the goal might be to get a high score, for example. And in a game like Pac-Man, the system might get a reward each time the character eats some food, and if it hits a ghost, it receives a punishment. And that's all the feedback it gets. Each time it makes a winning move, it strengthens the connections for the things that it did previously, and if it loses, it weakens the connections to what it tried. Given some inputs like the image pixels from a game, it can then explore different combinations of available actions that it can perform through thousands or even millions of iterations until it finds a combination of rules that link the inputs to the outputs such that it can perform well at the task at hand.
Reinforcement learning is an active area of research to be aware of and certainly one to monitor for the future, but you'll find that supervised learning is where you see most focus right now. For that reason, you'll be focusing on supervised learning in this course, which at present is one of the most used and mature forms of ML, which can solve many of the common problems that you'll encounter in the industry today. So head on to the next video to learn how we can train ML systems.